So if we look at kind of a zoomed in view of the presynaptic versus the postsynaptic, and we kind of see what's happening. So if we kind of combine everything we saw in the last video and bring it all together, what we have is this overview. And so what's happening is we have our calcium ports right here and also right here. And then we also have our sodium channels as well. And if you remember, our sodium channels are going to be the sodium calcium exchangers. And these are all, I mean, these are going to be voltage gated. So what's going to happen is we have ionic current flowing through the open channel. So this is our voltage gating, allowing the current to through, flow through the channel. And this is sort of an example of um, an EPS, uh, EPSP. And so what's going to happen is we have a transmembrane voltage cha change, so a um, uh, basically a PSP. The result is in a graded and localized response. This is not going to be a conduction like an action potential, but it spreads passively, so it's going to continue to spread as we go through. And so if we kind of take the breakdown of this, once again, as we saw before, we have our endosome here that's creating these vesicles. And we also have the vesicles coming back up. And they all have content within them. And then these contents are also released into the synaptic cleft. And then we also, we have the transmission of these into the ligand gated ion channel. And we also, we have our sodium passing through there as well. So we're looking at this again and basically this, there's going to be ionic selectivity that's going to control what can be sent out of the presynaptic and what can enter the postsynaptic. Um, this is going to, depending on what is transmitted, it's going to basically determine the result that's observed in the postsynaptic neuron. So it's either going to be inhibitory or excitatory. Like for, exa for example, if acetylcholine is being released and from the presynaptic and it's entering the postsynaptic, um, this is going to be an ex ex example of an excitatory response and this is the same with L-glutamate. Now, if GABA, on the other hand, is released, what's going to happen is it's going to be inhibitory. So we know that as sodium is being pumped into here, this inward, net inward movement of the positive ions of sodium is going to lead towards depolarization. And this constant depolarization results in a strong potential leading towards um, a strong um, EPSP. And this is basically a tiny graded response now, an easy or a thing that is good to remember is that EPSP is different than an action potential or an AP. Um, so if we look at kind of a breakdown, so we have EPSP and we have an action potential, we're comparing the two, what we'll see is the EPSP is ligand gated, while the action potential is going to be voltage gated. Now in terms of the potential itself, the EP EPSP is going to be a greater potential. And what that means is it's going to it's kind of like building blocks. So if I keep adding on to my building blocks, I'm going to have basically something bigger. And so as we go down the chain, the more that's added onto the building blocks, the stronger the potential. Now, as we know with a voltage, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, an action potential, this, uh, an action potential has to reach threshold. And what that means is it's an all or none. Meaning that for an action potential to occur, you either 
have the stimulus reaching the threshold in order for the action potential to occur or there's no action potential. Now in terms of the EPSP, it can go at sub-threshold. And the nice thing about an EPSP, it's a sum summation. So if it's added, as long as it's additive and we have enough of an additive response in terms of the potentials coming in, we're gonna have some EPSP occurring. Another big difference is it's never refractory. While we've learned in, in previous videos that action potentials are, they have a refractory period. Another way to say that is basically it means it needs to have time to recoup. The EPSP is going to spread passively. while the action potential is going to conduct actively. And that makes sense with the action potential. If it's all or none, you have to have a signal saying, hey, turn on, do something. Well, the EPSP is going to keep going, and it's going to spread passively, and then you can have a, a, a strong or a weaker response. So now in terms of our receptors, if we go back to this picture right here, we can have different um, receptors here as well as here. And you, there are two main types related to action potential that are important to know. One is the AMPA receptor and the other is the NIMDA receptor. And so the AMPA receptor if you have L, it's basically L-glutamate is going to act on your AMPA receptor through the CNS. And this is going to allow for sodium and potassium ions to pass through. And this is going to lead to an EPSP in response to, uh, to L-glutamate. So if we have L-glutamate around, we're going to have an EPSP. And as we've learned already, L-glutamate is excitatory. Now, NIMDA, on the other hand, if we were to look at a NIMDA receptor, Basically, what we're going to see is a receptor that has magnesium in front of the receptor. And magnesium basically blocks the transmission of anything through the receptor. And it's only when there is the combined action of glutamate. So what happens is you have to have glutamate binding onto the receptor, and you also have to have um, sodium and, and um, calcium that's uh, binding on as well. And once we have the complete binding, then there's a conformational change allowing magnesium to pass through and get out of the way. And what's interesting about NIMDA is this receptor if we want an EPSP to happen, we can also have this receptor call AMPA receptors, and this is going to allow for a, a stronger stim stimulus. So when we have our NIMDA receptor, we're going to have depolarization occurring, and it's going to, uh, by a high frequency of activation of your adjacent AMPA receptor. So we have our AMPAs right here. And as we know, this is our NIMDA. And so this is going to increase our calcium concentration at the postsynaptic neuron that's going to, that alters the effectiveness of the synaptic transmission, which means it's going to lead to a long-term potentiation or a long-term depression. So those two terms, what they basically mean is if we have a strong stimulus, so like an emotional memory, so sometimes people associate like a certain smell or they associate a certain, um, you know, song to a feeling. And that 
that feeling is a result of a long-term potentiation where we have this moment where we saw someone we were dating and we love them so much and then there's a song playing in the background or the smell of their perfume anytime we smell that perfume somewhere else or we hear that song there's this connection now to that person and this is a result of a long-term potentiation now long-term depression on the other hand is a bit different it's exactly as it sounds it's when that emotional memory or that memory subsides so now um, we're going to get into long-term depression and um, potentiation a little bit. So now if we look at LTT, LTD versus LTP, so long-term potentiation versus long-term depression. Now, the long-term potentiation is a central synapse are activated strongly. There's a number, so the number of receptors increase. And this can happen for hours or even days. And so we're going to have more AMPO receptors in the postsynaptic. And it's a result of increased frequency of stimulation and activation of both AMTA and NIMDA. So we're going to have this increased frequency as a result of the increased AMPA and NIMDA receptors. And this is going to lead to release of calcium. And this is going to basically trigger this ca uh, cascade that's going to allow for calcium dependent uh, events, including ca uh, calcium calmodulant dependent protein kinases leading to the phosphorylation of AMPA receptors and increased AMPA receptors. Now, long-term depression, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. So we're going to have decreased receptors. And the big thing is the neurotransmitter is glutaminergic. And so we're going to have dephosphorylation and, and down-regulation of our AMPA. And the interesting thing about LTT and LTP is that they can occur in the same neuron in response to different rates of excitation. Well, if you have any questions, comments about the video, please leave them below. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. And also, uh, if you like the channel, please subscribe.